First of all, I want to give credit for some of the ideas in this message um, uh, come from Dr., uh, Reverend Dr. Paul Duke, who said that he got the ideas from Fred Craddock. So I don't know who to give credit to originally. Um, I'm inclined to believe it goes back to the Holy Spirit. Um, I certainly hope so anyway. Um, but you know, we, we pastors, we learn and we borrow from each other. If we didn't, Sunday morning would be pretty boring during this time, I'm afraid. But, but let me read to you this scripture this morning that's found in the book of Acts. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. And then Philip ran up to the chariot and he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I? He said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer was silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? And then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. And then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized them. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Someone uh, asked Carl Sandburg, what is the ugliest word in the human language? Uh, and after um, thinking for a few moments, um, Sandberg said um, that the ugliest word is exclusion. Exclusion. Uh, that is a pretty ugly word. And all of us sitting in this room, I am sure have at one time or another in our life felt the sting of exclusion. We've felt what it's like to be excluded. And many of us have felt that uneasy feeling of being in a group of people who are excluding someone else. And you, you want to invite them in, but you're not sure what to do. And you're kind of caught, so we don't open the door. I, um, I heard the story, true story, someone overheard a second grader telling another second grader, I would like to be your friend but if I were your friend, my other friends wouldn't let me be their friend. So I can't be your friend. Now that doesn't just work with children, that's how it works with adults as well. Uh, sometimes we wish to include other people, but we're afraid if we do, we'll be excluded by our own group. And so we end up not doing it. So the angel of the Lord went to Philip and said, go south on the road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. And so Philip did as he was told and he ran into an Ethiopian eunuch. So Ethiopian, that means that most likely he was black. Now in those days, the, the word Ethiopia didn't just stand for a particular country or region, it stood for it, it, it meant the farthest away, it meant the ends of the earth, as far away as you could go. Today, we might say, uh, she is from Timbuktu. Uh, you know, just as far away as you get. And so he met a black man from Timbuktu, who was a eunuch. Now a eunuch 
is, is a man who is basically rendered sexless, mutated, mutilated. Um, you could be born that way. It could happen in an accident. Or some men were made that way intentionally so that they could work around the king's harem uh, because that would ensure that any offspring would belong to the king. So he's coming back from Jerusalem where he had gone to worship. Now, I find that just a really curious statement because he, re he reads the Bible. I mean, the story's about him reading the Bible. So he would know that eunuchs were not allowed in the temple. They were not allowed in the congregation to worship. And yet, it says he went to Jerusalem. I mean, it says so in the Bible. In, in Deuteronomy, look at, look at this verse from Deuteronomy chapter 23. It says, no one who has been emasculated by crushing or cutting may enter the assembly of the Lord. So eunuchs were not allowed to be a part of the congregation at worship. So he goes to worship at a place that will not let him in. And he drives a long way to get there. And he would be what we call a God-fearer. Um, that's a person who believes in the God of Israel, but hasn't yet converted to Judaism through circumcision or baptism. Uh, there were lots of God-fearers in the New Testament. Um, several Roman soldiers were God-fearers. They believed in the God of Israel, but for whatever reason, they had not um, you know, converted to Judaism. So, so what did he do in Jerusalem? Did he, did he just go to the outside wall and, and stand there? Did he put his hand on that outside wall and pray, hearing everything that was all the worship going on inside? I mean, can you imagine? Imagine a person who was excluded from church, but they drove all the way up and parked in the parking lot and got out and walked and stood outside a window so they could hear the songs being sung because they can't come in because they've been excluded. Standing outside and praying. Imagine that a person would drive a long way to do that. Imagine the faith of a person who loves God, but at the same time is excluded from worship by other people who say they love God how many times do you keep coming back after you've been denied entry? How many times do you keep knocking at the door when it's locked? And look at this guy. Now, he's an important official. He is the treasurer of the queen of Ethiopia. He's wealthy. We know that because he's riding in a chariot. Chariots were the luxury vehicles of that day. And he's educated. He, he's reading uh, from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So here's this guy. I mean, he's, he's got this really important job. He's, uh, he's wealthy. He's intelligent. But he is not welcome in the congregation of the people of God. Fred Craddock tells this story of when he was a student he was pastor of this small country church. And it was in East Tennessee, it was near um, uh, Oak Ridge. And it was during the time when they were building the nuclear power plant there. And so lots of people were moving into that area. And they were mostly living in trailer parks and working construction, getting everything built. And so Fred had a meeting with the board of his church and he said, this is an incredible opportunity for us. We, we can reach out to these people. I mean, they're coming in from everywhere and they're, they're right here around us. But some of the people on the board said, yeah, I, yeah, I don't think so. I mean, these folks are temporary and they, they live in trailers. They wouldn't fit in here. And so the board meeting lasted a long time and then they called a meeting for that Sunday evening. And the bottom line was someone made a resolution that basically said, members will be admitted to this church from families who own property in the county. 
They won't fit in. Decades later, uh, Fred and his wife, Nettie, were back in that same area. And he thought, I would like to see that little church now, see what it's like and show it to his wife. She'd never seen it. So uh, everything had changed. The city had grown up, you know, all around it. And uh, so he had a hard time, but he found it. And there it was. It was still that beautiful, white little building. Except the parking lot was full of cars and trucks. And there was a big sign hanging at the front of the church that said, Barbecue, <laughs> all you can eat, chicken, ribs, pork. And so Fred thought, well, we might as well have lunch. So they went in, even though it wasn't a church anymore, it was a restaurant now, but some of the stuff inside still looked the same. And as they were eating, he said to his wife, you know, it's a good thing. Uh, you know, he looked around and they were just, it was full of people, people from everywhere, just all kinds of folks in there. And he looked at his wife and he said, you know, it's a good thing it's not a church anymore or these people wouldn't have been welcome. They wouldn't fit in. So the Ethiopian eunuch coming back from Jerusalem in his chariot on the road to Gaza was reading from the scroll of Isaiah. And Philip ran up to him and he said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how can I? Unless someone explain it to me. And so he invited him to get in. Now, this is the equivalent of a foreign diplomat inviting a street preacher to come sit in his limo and explain the Bible to him. And let's listen again to what he was reading. This is what he was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter as a lamb silent before its share is silent. So he didn't open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch wanted to know, is he talking about himself or is he talking about someone else? Humiliated? Has no descendants? Sounds like me. <laughs> and Philip said, uh, He's talking about someone else. He's talking about Jesus. And so Philip began to explain to him that it was about Jesus. And he began to tell him the good news. And he said he started where he was reading here in Isaiah 53. And, but you know, I wonder if Philip didn't just unroll that scroll down a little farther to Isaiah 56, where it says this. Let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. Let no eunuch complain, I'm only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. <laughs> now the law clearly said eunuchs were not allowed in the temple. But Isaiah said, come on in, just come on in. And of course prophets always show more mercy than priests. So Philip says, Ethiopian eunuch, God welcomes you. Jesus welcomes you. Well, is there any reason I can't be baptized? Not a one, brother. Not a one. And I think that maybe both of them received a new understanding and a new life. An olive-skinned Jew and a black eunuch soaking wet, laughing out loud. Because in the love of Christ, their differences no longer mattered. And it happened on the road to Gaza. Dear God, let it happen again. You see, the entire book of Acts is about breaking down walls. It's about breaking down barriers. It's about welcoming people who were once unwelcome, including people who were once excluded. First, it was to the Jews. 
then to, the, then to uh, you know, he said, start in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Timbuktu. It started with the Jews, and then the God-fearers, and then the Samaritans, and then the Gentiles. The Spirit just kept pushing and keeps pushing to welcome those who have been unwelcome, to include those who have been excluded. And then Philip disappeared, and the Ethiopian eunuch, with newfound faith, rode off rejoicing. In her memoir, Leaving Church, Barbara Brown Taylor writes, every time I pass a church with that sign that says, open doors, open hearts, and open minds, we know who she's talking about there. I think, who do we think we're fooling? The church, no church is open to everyone. I would rather the sign read, we do our best, or better yet, Christians meet here, enter at your own risk. <laughs> One of the things I love about St. Paul United Methodist Church is that being a welcoming church is important to us. We want to be a welcoming church. We want to be inclusive. We don't always get it right. But God knows we want to. We really want to, all of us want to. So to those who have felt excluded from church, for whatever reason, maybe it was because you didn't have the right clothes to wear. Maybe it was because you think people will judge you. Could be you were excluded because of the color of your skin or your nationality because you were divorced, or because you weren't married, or because of your sexual orientation, or because of your gender, or these days because of your political beliefs. I can't even keep up, keep up with all the categories we use to exclude people anymore. But I just wanna say, you're welcome here. You're not tolerated, but you're celebrated. We're trying to get it right. You are welcome.